Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our first Conservation in the Classroom event of 2022. My name is Kate and I am your host. As some of you may know, International Day of Women and Girls in Science is coming up next week on February 11th. So we are kicking off the celebration with shark scientist Jasmine Graham today. Jasmine is the president and CEO of Minorities in Shark Science and is coming um, and is also WWF's 2021 Conservation Leadership Award winner. So Jasmine is here today to share with us some fascinating sharks and rays that she is working hard to protect. So Jasmine, thanks so much for being here. We're so excited to have you. Hi everyone, excited to be here. So before I pass things over to Jasmine officially, of course, we need to introduce our special guest that we have joining us on camera. So as we bring you in, make sure you say hi, nice and loud. First up from Carmichael, California, we have Miss Russo's fifth graders at Carmichael Elementary. Hi, everybody. Next, we have our group of Steggers from Natural Bridge Elementary located in North Miami, Florida. Hi. Joining us from Jacksonville, Florida, we have Tora Academy's third and fourth graders. Hi. And last but certainly not least, coming to us from Roselle, New Jersey, we have Mrs. Rukowski and Mrs. Redding, second and third graders from Dr. Charles. We need one of those volume scales to show how everybody did there. That was a great kickoff to the event today. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. We cannot wait to hear what questions you have. And speaking of questions, for those of you that are watching live on the web page, please make sure to use that Google form that you see on the website there to enter any questions that you have for Jasmine so that we can make sure to incorporate them into the Q&A at the end of her presentation. So without further ado, Jasmine, if you are ready, I think we're ready for you. You can take it from here. All right, thank you very much. I'm super excited to talk to everyone today about my favorite group of animals. So today we're going to be talking about elasmobranchs. So an elasmobranch is a scientific word that basically means sharks, skates, and rays. So elasmobranch, if we look at what that word literally means, elasmo uh, meaning striped, uh, brank meaning lung or gill, so literally striped gills. Uh, and the reason why they're called that is because these are animals that have more than one gill slit. So if I say the word fish, everyone thinks of a fish. Maybe you're thinking of a goldfish. Maybe you're thinking of a catfish. So we have fish. We've got fish that are made of bones, which are those goldfish, catfish. We've got fish that are made of cartilage, which is the same stuff that your ears and your nose is made out of this flexible stuff. These types of fish are called cartilaginous fishes, meaning they are made of cartilage. So they're really bendy and flexy. And that's the group of animals that elasmobranchs are part of. So elasmobranchs are made of cartilage and they have multiple gill slits. So if you think about a goldfish or a catfish, they only have one little flap on each side that covers their gills. And if you're ever on Jeopardy, it's called an operculum. You can tell your parents that. Um, so the elasmobranchs actually have more than one gill slit. So most of them have five. Some of them have six and some of them have seven, but most have five. Usually if they have six or seven, it's so unique that it's usually in their name, like a six gill shark or a seven gill shark. Um, so just remember, most sharks and rays are going to have five gill slits. So what's the difference between a shark and a ray? Good question, glad you asked. Well, I have some very fun things here in my treasure trove of animals. So I've got my first guest here. So this is a shark. So you can tell that this little friend here is a shark because he's got his gill slits on the side of his body, right there, side of the body. So sharks have their gill slits on the sides. So this is one of my little shark friends. 
Um, this is a sharp nose shark. And then I also have a little ray friend to show you. This is an Atlantic stingray. And you can tell that the stingray looks pretty different. So it's kind of like a pancake, kind of flat. And also its gills, its gill slits are on the bottom of its body. So this is the top. And then his mouth and his gills, well, actually this is a girl. Her mouth and her gills are on the bottom of their body. So that's the big difference between a shark and a ray. They're very closely related. They're both made out of cartilage, but sharks have their gill slits on the side and rays have their gill slits on the bottom. So I'm gonna introduce you to a couple of my favorite sharks and rays. So these are the animals that I study. So why do I study sharks and rays? Well, for one thing, I just think they're really cool. For another thing, they're really misunderstood animals. So a lot of people are very afraid of sharks because of movies and media. And so we think, oh, sharks are scary, but sharks are like any other animal living their life. Um, and so they're not out to get you. Um, you're not at risk of, <laughs> of getting attacked by a shark or anything like that. If you get in the water, sharks are just living their lives. So in the same way that a squirrel or a bumblebee or anything like that is li living its life, as long as you don't bother it, it won't bother you. As long as it doesn't think that you are trying to hurt it, uh, it will leave you alone. So most of the time, sharks are going to swim away. They're really afraid of people, actually. So you don't have to be worried about that. So shark attacks are super, super rare. And uh, actually, sharks should be more afraid of us than we should be of them. Because we actually, as humans, kill 100 million sharks a year. Think about how big that number is. 100 million million a year. That's wild. Uh, so that's why I study sharks, because a lot of people think that they're really bad and they have a lot of negative feelings about them. But there are actually a lot of species that we're actually losing. They're going extinct. So that's not good because they're really important to our ecosystem because they're predators. So they actually control all of the things on the food chain underneath them. So if we didn't have them, we wouldn't have something that weeds out all of the sick and old animals. We wouldn't have something that keeps the population of those animals down and they would get too big. Uh, and then we would have a huge problem on our hands. So if there are too many of this type of fish, that means that whatever that type of fish eats, it's going to eat too many of them. Uh, or if it's an herbivore, it's going to eat too many plants. So we want to make sure that we have these animals in our ecosystem because predators are really important to a healthy ecosystem. And when we get rid of predators, our ecosystems, they might collapse. And that would be very bad because then we wouldn't have fish to eat. Then we wouldn't be able to enjoy beautiful coral reefs and sea grasses and all of those lovely things that people like to swim and dive to look at things. We wouldn't have any of those. So that's why I'm interested in studying sharks and rays. So major threats for sharks are people catching them either on purpose or as what we call bycatch, which is when they're trying to catch something else, uh, but they accidentally catch a shark. And so the sharks can die and it's the same thing as if they were trying to catch them on purpose, even though it was an accident, same thing happened where the shark died. And so we have a lot of shark species that are what we call threatened. So we have an organization called the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, that takes all of the animals and plants and things in the world and tries to see how many there are left and they rate them. So there's least concern, which means we're not worried about them. They're doing great. We have near threatened, which is, uh-oh, things are going, things aren't going well. Um, then we have vulnerable, which is, all right, now we need to do something. And then we have endangered, which is, uh-oh, we have a problem. This animal's going extinct. And then we have critically endangered, which means this animal is as bad off as it could possibly be without going extinct. Uh, and so that is a real danger zone. So I study animals that are in the endangered and critically endangered category. And I try to see how we can change things to protect them and keep them around. 
So I'm also interested not only in just sharks and rays that are endangered, but also sharks and rays that have weird shapes. One, because they're cool to look at. Two, because if they have a weird shape, what that says to me is they might have a very special adaptation that allows them to do something really important. And even if we don't understand what that thing is, they have evolved to look that way for a reason. Um, and if other animals don't look like that, that probably means that those animals can't do the same things for the ecosystem that these weird shaped ones do. So that's why I'm interested in the weird shaped animals. So I'm going to start off by introducing you to a group of animals, which was the first group of animals that I started working with, the hammerheads. So I am going to talk a little bit about the hammerheads, but first, we had a little poll at the beginning of our live stream that asked how many species of hammerheads there are. And I saw a lot of people had some guesses. Not a lot of people were right. <laughs> so there are actually 10 species of hammerheads. A lot of people think that there's just one species of hammerhead and that they're all the same. That is not true. There are actually 10 species of hammerheads, two of which have been described recently. So in the past, at this point, it's been six years uh, since they have been described. So we're finding new species every day. A lot of the hammerheads actually look like other hammerhead species. We call them cryptic species because they look the same, but they're actually pretty different. So the first animal that I'm gonna introduce you to is the bonnet head. So we've got a bonnet head here. So this is a really cool animal. This is actually a baby. So they have little heads that look like this. Some really fun facts about them. They eat seagrass. So they're the only known shark that is what we call an omnivore, meaning that it eats plants and animals. So until a couple years ago, we thought that all sharks were carnivores and that they only ate animals. But bonnet heads actually eat plants, which is super duper cool. So another animal that I'm going to introduce you to is another species of hammerhead called a scalloped hammerhead. And I want to bring my friends from all of these schools on camera to tell me whether you think that the hammerheads are sharks or rays. And I'm going to put it really close so you can see that key feature. So if you think it's a shark, I want you to raise your hand. Who thinks it's a shark? I think it's a shark. Okay, we've got a lot of hands raised. Who thinks it's a ray? Who thinks it's a finger? Raise your hand. Okay, we've got a couple people that think it's a ray. Everyone that raised their hand for shark, you are correct. So the hammerheads are sharks. Good job, everyone. So this is a scalloped hammerhead. It's called a scalloped hammerhead because on its hammer part of its head, it has these little ridges. Scalloped hammerhead, just like the bonnet head is called a bonnet head because it looks like it has a little bonnet. So scalloped hammerheads are super duper cool. Uh, they are usually uh, pretty small, but they do get to be larger than our bonnet head friends. Our bonnet head friends are typically about three or four feet long. Um, these scallops can be more like four or five feet long. Um, the biggest hammerhead species, which I don't have a specimen of because they're really big, uh, is the great hammerhead. And those are really, really large animals, uh, which is why they're called great. So those are our hammerheads. Next, I'm going to talk about another group of animals called sawfish. So this is my sawfish friend. Uh, so sawfish, this uh, species of, of sawfish that I study is critically endangered. Uh, so obviously I don't have a specimen of that because that would be bad. Uh, we, we love the, 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 the little Samiar sawfish though. Um, so we have our saw part of our sawfish. This is how they get their name. So just like hammerheads have a head that's shaped like a hammer, the sawfish have a nose that's shaped like a saw. We're very creative in how we name our animals. Um, so they have this saw. 
It's also called a rostrum. That is the scientific name for it. It has all of these teeth, quote unquote, on the side of it. They're actually, fun fact, not teeth. They're actually scales uh, that have been modified to kind of work similar to teeth. So the way that these sawfish hunt is they have all sorts of sensory organs along this saw, and it's basically like a fish detector. So they can actually detect the electrical pulses coming from the heartbeat of the fish. So even if the fish is hiding and very, very still, guess what? Its heart is still beating and this can sense it. So they will be swimming, swimming, swimming like a little fish detector. They'll find a little school of fish and then they'll go cha 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 just like that. Um, and so that is how they hunt. So they'll hit the fish and then whenever they're injured, they'll go back through and swallow them whole. So this is our sawfish. Now, I want to bring our friends back on to talk about this new animal that we have here. So this is the sawfish. I'm going to bring it very close to you. I want to know if you think this is a shark or a ray. So if you think it's a shark, raise your hand. All right, we've got a few people that think it's a shark. Who thinks it's a ray? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Okay. So we've got a lot of people that are correct. It is a ray. Good job, everyone. Yeah, I heard someone as they're going off say, because their gills are on the bottom. That's what I like to hear. Yay. So a lot of people think that sawfish are sharks because they kind of look sharky, right? They look pretty different from that Atlantic stingray that I showed you that was pretty flat. Um, but this is a this is a ray. And um, they are super cool and unique because they have a tail that's similar to a shark. And they've got a dorsal fin that's similar to a shark, but they're actually a ray. So they are really, really neat. A lot of their main threats are bycatch, just like the other sharks and ray that I was talking about. So they have this saw that makes them really prone to getting tangled up in nets and things like that, which isn't great. Um, so that's why we want to protect them. They also have a nursery ground, which are mangroves, which are trees that actually have roots into the ocean, into the water along the coastline. Um, and when they're babies, they actually hide in those little tree roots so that they don't get eaten by predators. So now that we're losing those mangroves, sadly, uh, the population of sawfish uh, started declining. But very good news. Me and a lot of my friends that are also sawfish scientists have been working really, really hard. And we are actually seeing that the, saw, the small tooth sawfish in the United States is actually coming back a little bit. So the population is stabilized. Um, and we're hoping that soon we will see some increase in numbers. So this is a success story. Uh, if you ever see, especially my folks down there in Miami, I know we got some Miami people, you've got a lot of sawfish down there. So if you or any adults in your life see a sawfish, you make sure to tell them to go online and report that they saw a sawfish because we use all of that information to help understand how the population is doing. So be sure to tell your family, hey, if you see a sawfish, go online and report it. All right. So as I wrap up here, now that I'm done talking about all of my favorite animal friends, I want to leave you with this. So if you're thinking, oh, wow, sharks and rays are cool. You are correct. They are cool. And you might be thinking, well, if there's a lot of them that are endangered, what can we do about it? Well, one thing that you can do is that you can tell all of the all of the adults in your life that they should be mindful of where their seafood comes from. So there are things that are sustainable seafood where there's a lot of rules and regulations and they try to limit the amount of bycatch. And then there's what we call unsustainable seafood, uh, which means that they're not following the rules um, and they're not taking the animals in a way that maintains the health of the ecosystem. So make sure that your parents are buying sustainable seafood. Also, think about everything that you do and how it interacts with the ocean. So balloons, balloons are a big thing, especially for kids. What goes up must come down. So I spend a lot of time in the Everglades 
my Miami folks know about that, in the Everglades, uh, which is a really beautiful place where my sawfish live and where they're born and where they grow up. But sadly, every time I go, I have to pull balloons out of the water. So if you don't take anything else away, take this. Tell your parents there are other ways to show you care besides balloons. So ask for a toy, something like that. But balloons, what goes up must come down. So if you let a balloon go and it floats off into the air, just know that there's a chance that it might come down in a sawfish or a shark habitat. So those are the things that I want to leave you with. And with that, I will open the floor and I'll answer any questions that you all have. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jasmine. That was so much fun. And I cannot wait to hear what questions that everyone has for you. So those of you that are watching from the web page, last call for questions, make sure you get them entered into that Google form so we can ask as many as we can here. We are going to start with our groups on camera. So just a reminder, when it's your class's turn, make sure you ask your question nice and loudly to make sure Jasmine can hear you. So we'll start with Carmichael Elementary. If you all are ready, what is your first question for Jasmine? What is your perspective on aquariums specifically in regards to sharks and stingrays petting stations? Okay, so aquariums. So aquariums are really neat places because for a lot of people that don't live near the ocean, they might not ever get to see an animal in the wild. So an aquarium is a really, really good place for you to be able to see these animals in the wild. And it's really hard to sometimes for people to care about something that they've never seen or interacted with. So aquariums are a really great way for people to safely be able to interact with animals um, and to learn about them. So it's super great. Uh, there are um, some rules and regulations that aquariums follow. So there is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums that sets the standard of how aquariums are maintained for the health and safety of the visitors, the staff, and the animals. So if you're going to an aquarium, I would look up and see if they are AZA accredited. And if they are AZA accredited, know that those animals are super well taken care of and that they would never do anything that is going to hurt the animals. If you're going somewhere and it's not AZA accredited, then I would be maybe a little bit suspicious um, because they don't have those same rules and regulations to maintain the health and safety of their animals. So look for the little symbol that they're AZA accredited, ask someone, um, and if it is an AZA accredited uh, place, then that's a really good place to go to interact with animals. What a great question to kick it off here. Um, next up, let's go to our Stegos, our group in Miami. If you all are ready, what's your first question? Can sharks and can sharks have medical problems like humans? Yes, absolutely. Sharks do have medical problems. Um, but here's a really cool thing about sharks. Sharks heal very quickly. Um, so that's one of their things that they've adapted to be able to heal super quickly. So if they get a cut or a scrape uh, or they get in a fight with another shark and get bit, they heal really, really fast. Um, so a lot of the shark sicknesses don't look the same in people as they do in sharks. But yes, sharks can get sick. They can get parasites. Um, they can get tumors. They can get all sorts of things. Um, but they do have this incredible healing ability, which a lot of scientists in the biomedical field actually study to try and understand how sharks are able to heal so well um, and how they're, how they're able to uh, get over and um, not contract some of the sicknesses that people contract. So a lot of people in the biomedical field are trying to figure out if they can learn from sharks how to do that and make medicine so that people can heal really fast um, and avoid getting sick as well. That was a great question. That was a great question. It's like a sharp superpower. Um, okay, Torah Academy, you are up next. Nice and loudly for us, please. And Abigail, go. Abigail, go. How do you prevent a stingray from feeling threatened? 
Good question. All right, this is really important, everyone. So whenever you are going to the beach and you're gonna be walking, so stingrays love to bury in the sand. That's how they hide from predators. That's how they hunt. They'll like bury in the sand. They'll wait for something to come and then they'll sneak and surprise it and surprise it and get it. Um, so they spend a lot of time buried in sand and they're camouflaged, which means that it's sometimes really hard to see a stingray if it's buried in the sand, especially if the water isn't very clear. So very important thing. Whenever you're walking along the shoreline, you always want to do what's called the stingray shuffle, which you just move your little feet like this. Every day I'm shuffling. Da, 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 da. You just shuffle your feet. So you don't pick your feet up and walk like this because you might step on one. And if you step on one, it thinks, ah, something's trying to attack me. And it sticks its stinger up in the air. And then you got a barb in your foot or your leg. And that's not good. Um, so, But if you shuffle, it can feel the vibrations and it knows that you're coming. Um, and so you don't sneak up on it and surprise it. So they'll move out of the way as long as you're shuffling because you're disturbing the sand and they'll be like, oh, something's coming. Let me move. Uh, so you always want to announce your presence to the stingray because I'm sure if you've ever had anyone sneak up on you, it's really scary and you want to go, ah, immediately. Um, and you don't think about it. It's just a reflex. So they have the same reflex when they get stepped on where they just zing, put their stinger up. So as long as you shuffle, you'll be good to go. I love that. Can we sing when we shuffle too? Yes, we, it's a requirement. To, right? Every totally. day I'm shuffling. That's the only way it works is if you <laughs> sing while you're doing it. <laughs> okay, Dr. Charles C. Polk Elementary, you guys are up next. Go ahead. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Go ahead. Is, speak loud. Is the sawfish related to a crocodile? Is the sawfish related to a crocodile? No. Uh, so sawfish are elasmobranchs, so they're a ray. Uh, crocodiles are reptiles. So fish are over here. Reptiles are over here, mammals are over here. So sawfish aren't very closely related to us because we're mammals and they're not very closely related to crocodiles because they're reptiles. But they are closely related to other fish because they're fish. Another great question. Okay, we're going to take a few that were submitted from the webpage here, Jasmine. So we have a question from Ava in Berlin, Massachusetts, who wanted to know if sharks survive in lakes or only in salt water. So there are some freshwater sharks. Um, there are lots of freshwater stingrays. There are some freshwater sharks. Uh, so we don't have any freshwater sharks here in North America. Um, but there are other places, other continents, where the there are sharks that live in fresh water. Now, we also have some sharks that can go into what we call brackish water, which is, it's not as salty as the ocean, but it's not quite as fresh as fresh water. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, so one species that's famous for doing that is the bull shark. So bull sharks actually are able to maintain their balance um, and go from salt water to fresher water. Uh, so usually they're in like rivers that eventually lead to the ocean, um, but they've been seen in like the Mississippi River. They will go pretty far up river, um, farther than most people think that sharks will go. Um, but that's a really unique adaptation that they have where they actually can control their bodies and be able to live in both the salty water and the fresher water. So that's a really cool thing that they have. There are other species of sharks that do it more whenever they're younger. So they'll kind of be a little bit more in the river when they're younger to hide from predators. But as they get older, they lose that ability to kind of regulate themselves. And so if they go into salt water, if they go into fresh water, they don't feel so well. Um, and same thing with our uh, freshwater sharks. If the freshwater shark was to go into salt water, well, it's not adapted for salt water. So it won't feel very well. Uh, so it won't make it very far or it'll turn around and go back into the freshwater. 
Okay, we have another question here from um, Nick in Golden Downey that wanted to know if sharks lay eggs. Yes, there are sharks that lay eggs. Um, so there are lots of different ways that sharks reproduce. Some of them lay eggs, um, and they're called often mermaid purses because they kind of look like little purses. Um, so a lot of cat sharks do that. There are different species of sharks that lay eggs. Um, and then there are some sharks that give live birth. So they actually keep their eggs inside them. Um, and then, you know, they come out of the eggs and then they're born live. And then there are some sharks that their little babies kind of just sit um, in their the mom's belly and they have a little yolk sac attached to them. So they're not actually enclosed in an egg in the traditional sense, um, but they have a little yolk sac, similar to how mammals have a umbilical cord that connects them to the mom to get food. They have what's called an umbilicus which connects them to a little ball of yolk, which they eat. Um, and then once that yolk is gone, uh, they're all ready to be born. And so they're, they're born, um, whether they hatch or whether they're born live, they are coming out with the ability to swim and eat and hunt and everything. So they're fully formed, they come out. Um, sharks don't have any sort of parent care uh, so they're not like the mom and dad aren't there like helping them. They like drop them off and they're like, cool, you're on your own. So um, sharks, whenever they're born, they're fully capable of doing all the things. So that yolk sac or that egg basically gives them a chance to get nutrients while they grow and are become strong enough to swim and hunt on their own whenever they're born or they hatch. Very cool. Okay. Our on camera groups, if you are ready for our second round of questions, we'll go in the same order. So first up is Carmichael Elementary. Your next question for Jasmine, nice and loudly for us. Are there international waters where countries do not have to follow fishing regulations? Are there countries that refuse to follow regulations regarding the fin trade? That is a very good question. Um, so yeah, something that makes conservation and protecting sharks or any species difficult is that the sharks don't know that they're swimming from, you know, the waters of this country to that country. They're just swimming. And if country A and country B don't protect the animals in the same way, um, even if country A is doing everything that they can to protect the animals, as soon as they swim into the waters of country B, if country B isn't doing the same thing, then they might be at risk. Um, and so that's the issue that we face right now where different countries have different regulations um, and different countries enforce those regulations differently. So some countries are very strict and they have really strong policies and they work really hard to protect different species of sharks. And then there are other countries either where they don't have those policies in place or they do, but they don't enforce them. Um, and so some of reasons why they might not enforce them is they don't have money to enforce them. Um, they might have, you know, other issues going on in their country that they're focused on um, dealing with. And so protecting the ocean just doesn't fall very high on the priorities. Uh, so a lot of what we do is try to work with countries and see, OK, what are the issues that you're having with enforcing or making decisions? How can we help? Um, try to get them the most information that they can. Try to um, help them and their local communities come up with regulations that work for everyone. Um, so it's really important that the regulations help um, just the, the help the animals and help the people. Uh, so if one of the issues of enforcing is that people need to eat, then we need to find a way that we can fish sustainably um, so that people can eat, but also the animals are protected. So that's what makes it all very difficult is there's a lot of moving parts. It's not just about the animals. We also want to make sure that people have food. We also want to make sure that everyone feels safe and can do their jobs and everything like that. And so we have to work with the fishers. We got to work with the uh, with different countries uh, because we all share the same ocean. 
and our sharks are swimming all over the place. And so we have to all work together. And so that's why sometimes things take a long time, because if you've ever worked with a group project, you know, it's really difficult to get people to all agree on things. So that's what we're working on now is how we can come up with a solution that works for everyone. That was a really good question. Um, okay, let's go to our stegos in Miami. What is your next question? Will a shark eat a stingray? Yes. So some sharks love stingrays. So hammerheads love to eat stingrays. That's like their favorite thing to eat. Uh, so they actually will use their, their heads to like pin the rays down with their heads so that they can eat them. Uh, and they also have some adaptations where the barbs of the stingrays don't really affect them very much. Um, so they will just keep on munching. It'll like, you know, sting them in the mouth or whatever. And they just are, they don't really react. Uh, so I've caught some hammerheads before with like stingray barbs, like multiple stingray barbs coming out of its jaw and it's just swimming around like, this is fine, everything's fine. Uh, so yeah, so sharks do like to eat rays. Um, some of them, it's their favorite food. Uh, others, they will eat a ray if it's, you know, an opportune time um, and some specialize on rays. Tora Academy, you are up next. Go ahead with your next question for Nelson. How fast can sharks swim? How fast can sharks swim? That's a good question, and it depends on the shark. So some sharks swim very, very slow. Uh, so the Greenland shark lives in cold water, uh, so it swims super slow because it's got to preserve its energy. Uh, and then we have the short fin mako, which is the fastest shark uh, alive. And they can, they can swim in bursts at like 40, 45 miles an hour. Um, they can't swim that fast for that long, but yes, they can swim that fast for a little bit. Um, and then a lot of sharks are all in between. So we've got some two mile per hour swimmers and some 45 mile per hour swimmers. Uh, it all depends on the shark. Some sharks are more adapted to be quick um, and some sharks are more adapted to be slow. Okay, and our group from Charles C. Polk Elementary, it is your turn. Go ahead. How long do rays live? How long do rays live? Well, that depends on the species. So um, they have varying life spans. Um, so some might only live for, you know, a, a 10, 10, 20 years or so. Some live to be 80. Um like our, you know, our lifespan. So it really just depends on the ray. Um, but yeah, so it varies. A lot of my answers to these questions are, it depends. Sorry about that, but it does. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> um, I know we are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. So let's take, I know that there were a couple questions that were submitted through the chat that I wanted to make sure to ask you here, Jasmine. Um, Julian in Michigan and Sharon from Rockford, Illinois, both had similar questions. If you could talk a little bit about how you got interested in sharks and rays, like did you grow up near the ocean or how did you get into marine biology? Um, so I spent a lot of time near the ocean. Uh, so my dad's from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, so I spent a lot of time fishing with him. And so I really fell in love with the ocean. Um, and I was really interested in fish. And then I went to college and I met a scientist that um, studied sharks. And I had never really thought about sharks because, you know, we didn't fish for sharks. We didn't really interact with sharks. So I was pretty neutral about sharks. Um, I definitely wasn't one of those people that was afraid of sharks, but I just didn't think about them at all. Uh, but then I met him and he was super excited about sharks. And so I figured, why don't I try this since this man is so excited about them. And so I started working with him on a project with hammerheads and I fell in love with sharks and rays. And I tried a bunch of other different things while I was in college um, in terms of marine biology, because there's lots of things you can study if you study the ocean. Um, but I kept coming back to sharks. And so that's what I've been doing for however long I've been doing this, eight years, something like that. 
Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, we probably have enough time for maybe like one more question here. Um, Stacy in New Jersey in Roselle, New Jersey wanted to know what is the most dangerous shark in the world? Um, well, that is difficult to answer because uh, any animal is dangerous if you make it mad. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, I will say that there are some sharks that get a particularly bad reputation. Um, bull sharks, white sharks uh, get a lot of movies and, and film made after them. Uh, that shows them as being like super aggressive or, or whatever. Um, I will say that I work with sharks and I have worked with sharks for a long time. And I am doing what probably people who probably is upsetting to them. You know, I'm like measuring them and um, tag, putting tags on them and releasing them. And so I'm around a lot more sharks than, you know, the average person is in very close proximity, like my hands are all up in their face um, doing stuff. And I have yet to be bit by a shark. Uh, so if that tells you anything, someone that's around them all the time and does stuff with them all the time uh, that they maybe don't like, <laughs> at least in the moment, similar to like, you know, you go to the dentist and like, it's good for you. And they're like, they're, the dentist isn't out there to hurt you, but you probably are like, I wish this dentist would get out of my face. Uh, they probably feel the same way about me. And uh, I've never had any issues with them. I've swam with them. Um, I've worked with them a lot. And I've never had a moment where I even thought that, you know, it was trying to be aggressive or anything towards me, aside from like, it wants to get back in the water. <laughs> uh, so I think that sharks aren't any more dangerous than any other animal. Um, I mean, people get attacked by dogs all the time and we bring dogs into our house and put funny outfits on them and let them sleep in our bed and eat off of our dinner plates. So I wouldn't worry about sharks. Uh, and there's not any one species that you should be worried about. Uh, basically you leave sharks alone. They'll leave you alone. Listen to the lifeguards. Don't do anything that someone tells you not to do. Don't go touching wild animals. As a general rule, don't touch wild animals and pay attention to what people tell you to do and don't do anything that's unsafe. Um, and you will almost always be good. There are incidents that happen that are not provoked, um, but in the grand scheme of statistics, you know, you're more like, you've probably heard all the things, you're more likely to be struck by lightning, you're more likely to be bitten by a dog, you're more likely to be killed by a vending machine, all of these things. Um, wouldn't worry about it, wouldn't stress about it. It shouldn't stop me from going in the ocean because the ocean's a really cool place and there's a lot of really great things to learn and experience in the ocean. So never let a fear of any animal stop you from enjoying nature because nature is amazing and not only should it be protected, but it should be enjoyed. And I will leave you all with that. I think that was a perfect way to close this with those last tips to share with everyone. So thank you for that, Jasmine. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to add um, a few reminders here for everyone. So teachers, parents, guardians, if you're interested, we do have a packet available on the Conservation in the Classroom webpage there that kind of goes along with Jasmine's presentation. So there's links to different Kahoot games all about sharks and rays that have a lot of the information she spoke on in her presentation. Also a Kahoot about oceans and, and their conservation. There's a quiz worksheet and links to different videos from WWF about sharks and rays. I know we ran out of time. We, I, we could sit here and talk about sharks all day with Jasmine, but if you still have questions that we didn't have time to get to, you can email them to us at Wild Classroom at that email address that you see on your screen, and we'd be happy to pass those along to her. Um, just a reminder too, I know we mentioned it in the beginning, but International Day of Women and Girls in Science is next Friday, February 11th. 
So make sure to do all things science that day and check out Wild Classroom next week. We have a special activity packet that will be available all about scientists that are affiliated with WWF. And last but not least, make sure to mark your calendars for our next event coming up on February 17th with Aaron Simon. Um, Don't be trashy, the plastic problem. So another ocean themed event with a WWF women scientist. So Jasmine, thank you so much for being here. This was so much fun. We really appreciate it. We're going to bring everybody back on camera one last time to say goodbye. We'll see everybody next time.